yeah, this would be the record small class now. Five people. Well, now we're below 10%. Maybe I should make the entire final about the one class that where the recording doesn't work. Is that just mean? I wouldn't do that. I'm actually quite surprised at how many people are afraid they're going to fail. I've heard from several students that way, and I'm like, are people really concerned about this? Or is this just the overachiever group? Well, I can pretty much pretty much guarantee you that I'm going to have some sort of question about a Martian or lunar and or lunar data center on that final exam, because I think it's just such a cool question. And then to have somebody actually get funding to plan out a lunar data center, it's like, wow, that's, that's really what you want. You want to have $5 million to go and do something that's just like crazy. I mean, five million bucks doesn't go very far these days. And of course, they probably had to put their money in Silicon Valley Bank, but you laugh. I actually was reading a story in the New York Times about some startup company that was literally doing like daycare, but you know, tech style. So they're matching people up probably with an app and their requirement of their funding people was they had to keep the money in Silicon Valley Bank. So the CEO, spent their entire weekend trying to figure out how they were going to get the money to make their payroll on Monday. Because they shut the bank on Friday. And they spent all day Friday trying to get the money out. And because I've had these interesting discussions, um, you know, the, the, the Reddit community is always very, very kind and forgiving about these sorts of things. And they specifically said, well, you know, gee, we really shouldn't be bailing these people out. And I'm like, well, OK, there were a whole bunch of, of caregivers who basically wouldn't have gotten paid. And in the state of California, not pay, making your payroll is a going out of business strategy. The fact that you get your money back in two years had a moot. At any rate, hopefully none of you have to worry about that. Or maybe all of you will have to worry about that because you're CEOs of startup companies. Any, anybody doing a startup yet? I waited two years after I graduated before I did my first startup. Uh, very brief logistics. Uh, Project 4 is now in the can. I'm not sure that extending it was a good idea still. I'll look and see what the final results were. Um, since you're the six people who showed up here, did you use the extension or not? Two people say yes, two people shook their heads no, um, two people were kind of not awake yet. Fine. Uh, project 5 is now due on the 13th of April. That is actually, as weird as it sounds, I feel like we're in late March, but it's four weeks away. Uh, four weeks from Thursday, I think. It is. Weeks, four weeks, I don't know. Okay. With four weeks worth of lectures, this being the first of those. That's what, that's the problem. Too early. All right, the final exam is scheduled April 20th, uh, 8.30 a.m. Format is still TBD. I'll talk about that more as we get closer to it. Uh, I actually planned on the last day being uh, the optional presentations for people who did all uh, the alternate path stuff and uh, the final. You know, it shouldn't be too too bad. It should only have like one question. You know, it might have 36 parts to it. One question. And that'll all be about lunar data center design, no doubt. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I really am joking. Um, I don't know yet. Uh, nothing's changed here. The last two times I've run office hours on Thursday, nobody's actually shown up. So I don't know. I'll be around on Thursday again. Just did something mostly useless then. People did show up on Tuesday, though. That was interesting. I didn't have any specific readings here. There are a couple of links to papers. 
Anybody have any questions? Nah, didn't think so. Let's talk about a failure then. Let's see, this happened on January 31st, 2023 at a company called GitLab. Um, in case you're unfamiliar with GitLab, they are an alternative to GitHub. They provide popular services. In fact, it's actually not uncommon for people to mix and match services. I did some work on a case where, I'm doing a work actually still, on a case where the code is stored in GitLab, but they use Atlassian's services for tracking issues through Jira and Confluence. Very, very interesting how these, these things picked off of different vendors and provided. But at any rate, GitLab hosts people's source code. Does this sound bad? If something bad goes here? Yeah, maybe. If that was one of the places where you stored things, this is a good lesson, which is you can actually do replication yourself. Uh, Git makes it really easy to store things in multiple different uh, uh, services. So I can push into GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub, and get my own manual replication. On January 31st at 17.20 UTC, this is actually, there. they reported it in uh, UTC. I like that. There's no ambiguity with UTC versus um, a fight I've had this week about uh, the difference between daylight time and standard time, which is always a hot button for me because I don't want to keep track of what your random podunk locale does with daylight time. And it's really hard right now because working with people in, the, in Europe, they're not on daylight time. They go on daylight time on Sunday morning. There's like this two week or three week interval. And so it's always like you get people who over specify. In this case, it was somebody who specified central standard time. Like, okay, well, hey, that's only one hour off for me. They didn't mean standard time. So I like UTC. For some reason, at 5.20 UTC PM, they made a copy of the production database into staging. And, and the blog post actually goes into more detail about what they're doing. And I'm not even sure why they mentioned it, because in the end, it, it, it's just kind of not material to what actually went wrong. But they noticed at 1900 that there was a spike in database load. And they suspected that it was caused because somebody was creating spam. The actual issue turned out to cause, the, the, the problem it caused was that users couldn't post comments on issues or merge requests. Uh, so that's basically the morning here. 1720 UTC is, is morning here. So this started at the beginning of the West Coast workday. And so now you can't, you can't deal with issues, you can't do merges. Um, this is not a good thing. It turns out the real issue was that they were deleting all of the data for a GitLab employee accidentally or deliberately. Someone had trolled them and reported that GitLab employee for abuse. And their automated system said, OK, we'll delete all their data. This does not sound like a good idea. And clearly, this had nothing to do with the production people. This is somebody else building some other autonomous piece. But apparently, that GitLab employee had a lot of data. And so this caused a database load spike. So here we are, six hours later, where because of this load, the secondary replication, they have a primary secondary model. This is project three. They're a primary secondary model, and the secondary model now starts falling behind because there's so much traffic that it can't actually keep up with the, with the load. And here's where things get interesting. The primary has already garbage collected its log. So the secondary is behind the primary, and the primary no longer has a way of telling the secondary how to fix the problem. And since you just got done finishing looking at garbage collection in logs, this is very germane. I liked it. I was like, oh, this is great. They're going to look at this and they're going to, oh, yeah, this is the danger with cleaning up logs. You know, it's, it's, it's like when you clean a house and you throw something away and then you go looking for it the next day and you go, I hadn't used it in two years. And I just got rid of it. Now I need it again. 
So their solution to this was, oh, well, we'll manually resynchronize the primary backup. So what this ultimately made them do is delete the secondary backup entirely. Because, of course, without that log, they have no way of getting it back in sync. So they just throw everything away and start all over again. And then copy the primary to the secondary. The problem there is that the copy routine then failed to start correctly. And the copy routine, it turns out, actually blocks waiting to hear from the primary to start talking to the secondary, but it doesn't give you any feedback. It's like, you know, you type a, these are command line tools, right? So you type a command on the command line and it just blinks at you. Bing, 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 nothing. You don't get any feedback. You don't know what's going on. You're like, WTF? Because you're already in a stress mode at this point, right? I mean, th these are the production people who are like going, this is not good. We're vulnerable here. So they tried to clean up the database directory on the secondary and restart, and oh no, guess what? They deleted it on the primary. This is human error now. Does this start to sound bad to you? Yeah, me too. And, and I feel like this is like a Russian proverb, you know, Russian story, and then things got worse. So it turns out that they were doing backups of their database onto S3, and this was an automated process and had been going on for a long time. But their automated process of backing up to S3 always deleted old copies of, of old backups. But they had updated their database and the tools they were using for the particular SQL server that they were employing won't work if there's a version mismatch between the backup tool and the database. So for some period of time, nothing had been getting written to the S3 buckets, but they were deleting all the old copies. So by the time they went and looked at S3, it was empty. This no doubt made the accounting people happy because, of course, S3 charges by how much you use. And if you're not using anything, the charges go down. This does not make the production people happy, on the other hand. Um, nobody noticed. This is one of the problems with automated processes, is that when they stop working, it's often not even noticeable. I mean, anybody in here use Windows? There's this thing called the event log, which is this massive database of all the things that are going on in your system. And if you actually wade into it and look, there's all sorts of warnings and occasional errors. And you're like, computer still works. Why would I go looking, wading through this crap? And I mean, it's mostly numeric data, too, which makes it not particularly easy for normal people to go through and figure out what's going on. Um, so the other thing they normally did was they did Azure snapshots of disks they were using. Isn't this great? They're using S3, they're using Azure. This is like this whole blended environment where they've got things replicated across different cloud service providers. Normally they have Azure Disk Snapshots enabled, but they didn't do that for their database because they had these other backup mechanisms. Uh, so they decided that they were gonna have to actually restore from a, an LVM, Logical Volume Manager, snapshot. And the time to restore was approximately 18 hours. This is like forever. This is actually the problem with backup. You figure out when your backups don't work, because you're trying to restore. One of the hard and fast rules when you actually build backup systems is to make sure that on a regular basis, you test to make sure that you can restore the data. If you were to do that once a month, somebody would have noticed those S3 backups were gone. Wait a minute, I tried to do a restore from S3 and it's not there. That's what the, and that's actually what they were doing. That snapshot they took at the very beginning was actually for a staging environment. And they wanted to be able to test to see uh, if some change or other they were trying to apply was actually going to work right. Because this is a real issue. Um, it is not uncommon, when, especially when you're in dev, to not have access to a system that is as large and as powerful as your actual deployment model is. I mean, so I have a picture of um, uh, Andy Warfield standing next to a 70,000 node cluster. 
down in Silicon Valley. This is like six years ago. If you're writing software for a 70,000 node cluster, you're not going to have a test environment to duplicate it. You're just not. You're going to do your best job. And I've had to fix those kinds of bugs. I got a bug report one time years ago where somebody said, oh, I've got 72 cores on my system, and it's, it's, it's crashing. And when we'd written that code, the most you could have was 64. And someone had decided to hard code a table of 64 entries. So when it went to 72, it broke. So the immediate mitigation was turn off hyperthreading. So instead of having 72 logical cores, you had 36 logical cores, and the problem went away. But of course, the client wasn't happy with that, so we had to actually figure it out. I didn't have a 74 or 72 core machine to test, but it turned out there were magic settings inside of um, Hyper-V, believe it or not, that would allow you to simulate the things that we needed to simulate to make it look like you had more than 64 cores, what they called processor groups. So you build mechanisms to try and test those things. But you're right, it is a real problem. My takeaways here, as I said, restore time is the worst time to figure out your backups didn't work. And this is a quotation from the blog post. Why was the backup procedure not tested on a regular basis? Because there was no ownership. As a result, nobody was responsible for testing this procedure. If somebody doesn't own it, it doesn't happen. If somebody doesn't own it and it doesn't get done, if somebody does own it and it doesn't get done, then you can at least go blame somebody. But in this case, it's just actually a failure to realize that this is really important. Redundancy really is your friend. Notice they were able to get their database back, albeit with effectively 24 hours of lost time and productivity. That probably didn't meet their SLAs to their customers. I'm sure it didn't meet their SLAs to their customers. So that costs the company money. And the interesting thing is that when you start talking to accountants and people who worry about optimizing the economic efficiency of the company, the accountants often don't have a scope to understand risk management. What they know is, hey, look, our S3 bills are way down. This is great. We're not going to mention that to anybody because it's not a problem. The accounting department doesn't like redundancy. It costs money. We didn't really spend much time talking about it, but one of the big things as we, like when we started replicating our, our sharded key value store, um, there are actually encoding mechanisms called erasure codes that allow us to store chunks and pieces in different places that do not cost as much. So they're not just pure replication. We're just doing pure replication right here. But in fact, we can actually do a, a striped parity kind of replication where I can have n copies and I can lose some subset of that n copies and still get the data back. The more failures, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, right? The more failures I can tolerate, the more expensive it becomes. Early on, I pointed to you that there actually are computer systems where they run processors in lockstep. Those machines are extremely expensive. The people who pay for that are, mm, uh, big banks and financial institutions that require very high uptime, where to them, the cost of that machine is small in comparison to the cost of it going down. In this case, this costs GitLab a lot of money, but the accountancy doesn't look at that. They don't understand the necessary nature of risk. One of the things you will have to do as you work in this business is understand how to explain those kinds of risks to people. Part of the motivation for giving you failure cases is to look at this and to say, this is why this matters. This is why it's important. And this is why you're going to have to be able to explain these things. Why are you spending all of this time implementing this crazy ass distributed consensus algorithm? Well, because we want to make sure that we don't end up in a situation where we lose all of our data. Why do you geo-replicate geo things? It's expensive. Um, there's a really good write-up about this, including the denial of service attack, i.e. on the GitHub employee, that led to this database meltdown. And that was this year. That wasn't that long ago. And part of the reason I pick old ones and new ones is to give you the sense that these things keep happening. They don't stop. And you'll also notice that I keep hitting the same themes over and over again. I've hit the whole backup and restore problem before. 
I really liked this one because it was, oh, we've garbage collected our log. I know database people who never garbage collect their log. They will write it to stable storage someplace, cheap stable storage, rather than garbage collect it. Because if it's there, it might take me a while to get it back. But if it's not there, can't find it. Can't do anything with it. Um, I do research in trying to make things easier to find, and one of the really neat numbers I just saw was uh, that 25% of assets cannot be located when the, the, the person trying to use the asset needs it. And so they just spend, instead of continuing the search, they actually just recreate it. Now, in this particular instance, assets mean things that are used for, uh, for graphics. Uh, this was out of the game, game industry. Uh, game, web design, those kinds of things, they all use that same concept of, of these objects. Assets just a kind of object. 25%. My jaw kind of dropped. And this was actual research going, wow. Never throw anything away because it's so cheap to store it, but if you can't find it, it might as well have been thrown away. So... Today we're going to talk a little bit about peer-to-peer -peer and mobility because a lot of where we see peer-to-peer -peer things happening is on the edge in mobility. Uh, I don't know, does, do any of you have mobile phones? Right, so you probably don't know much. I mean, it doesn't have much applicability in the real world here. A lot of the kinds of things we're doing in replicating this data are there to support things like these mobile systems. Why do we have replicated caches? Why did I talk about memcache? I talked about it because we rely on it in order to get things to our phones as quickly as possible. We build caches very close to the devices to make it seem more responsive. Well, the problem is as soon as you start caching things, then you have to have some sort of a cache invalidation scheme because these data, this data can change. Uh, the guest speaker last week was talking about kind of an extreme instance of that where uh, he was talking about assets. And not only do you have an asset, but you have 500 different versions of the same asset. You can't download them all in your phone. Well, I suppose you could, but you wouldn't want to see the data overage bill. So we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the techniques that we end up using in mobile systems and peer-to-peer -peer networks in order to to make them scalable and in order to make them work. And ultimately, they rely on the kinds of distributed systems that we've been talking about and we're, we've been discussing building. A lot of what ends up happening here is that we end up building abstractions on top of the actual network infrastructure. Your phone is talking to a cell tower. As you move around, the cell towers are transparently switching you from place to place. You might be changing network addresses as that goes. So somewhere, somebody has to keep track of what the mapping is between your current network address and your identity. So we have some sort of a naming service that has to go on here. And this sort of name mapping and name management happens at a variety of different levels. It happens on our phones. It happens because we, you know, we have process names and file names and object key names and so on and so forth. We have to do it at the network level where we're mapping between different address spaces. And IPv6 is actually used a lot in mobile networks. We don't think too much about that, but we got a lot of mobile devices. We have a lot of devices that, that show up and disappear. And we need a much larger address space. Now, of course, your phone probably has an IPv4 address as well, but it might be hidden behind a, a network um, translation table, network address translation table, NAT. You remember that term from networking. That was a great trick. I mean, in the 1990s, we knew we were going to run out of IPv4 addresses. I mean, after all, there's only 32 bits of them. And early, early on, there were people who were given Huge hunks, what are known as class A addresses, where the first, first eight bits belong to one entity. When I was at Stanford, we had the 36 subnet. We literally owned millions of IP addresses. But they knew they were going to have to give that up. So they actually had a class B address, which is the first two, two octets are defined. Um, we had a mapping from 36 dot whatever to, to the class B address. Now, 
we can fight over individual IPv4 addresses. At home, you probably don't even get a static IPv4 address. You probably get a dynamic, dynamic IPv4 address. The problem with a dynamic IPv4 address is that it makes it harder for us to switch it around. We can switch it around. So you can have a website, and your website could switch between different IP addresses. But what unfortunately happens then is there's a period of time where somebody might have an old copy of the uh, your domain name to IP address mapping, and they try to get to your website, and instead they get some porn site, which probably isn't what you want people accessing your website to find. Or maybe it is. I don't know. So we abstract our network away in these, these mobile systems by building overlay networks, virtual networks on top of the underlying physical network. And essentially, this then becomes a clear area where separating the control plane and the data plane is very useful for us, because the control plane tells us about what the current configuration looks like. The data plane doesn't really care about what that what's going on at the control plane. It just, you, we, the control plane says, this is how you should be behave when you get these messages. You should send them here and there. And that keeps the data plane much easier to optimize. The less logic the data plane has to have within it, the faster it can actually execute. The second startup company I worked for did implemented a technology called asynchronous transfer mode, which are 48 byte packets. And one of the things that was interesting about this technology is it was always 48 bytes. There was no, no deviation there. The hardware that actually did forwarding of the packets would start forwarding the packet before it had fully arrived. That's as fast as you can make it. You get the first few bytes, you look at it, it tells you where you're supposed to put it. There's enough information there that you can start sending it out the output port. That's as low latencies we're actually going to be able to achieve in the real world. You don't actually have ATM at your home, but everything in the backbone runs ATM because of this very high speed switching ability. In fact, part of the work that I did at that company was um, standards work in defining what um, IP looked like. Actually, we only under Ethernet, Ethernet lands over IP running on Ethernet lands over ATM. So it was a whole uh, virtual networking. And that was a couple decades ago. So it, nothing's really changed there. We've just made it easier and faster for us to do this, to create these logical networks on top of the physical infrastructure underneath it. The state that we have to start replicating, and the reason that this is appropriate for distributed systems is because we actually have to maintain a consistent view of the state of the world. Our control plane becomes our replicated data set. We have to update things when we add new hardware or we remove hardware because the world has changed. When these are geo-replicated geo because we are distributing the state Look at a BGP route table. BGP is, is literally the routing protocol that we use to control the whole internet. And we define in, ingress and egress points in BGP for whole organizations, autonomous systems. And this state has to be replicated. Now we're back in distributed consensus once again. We have to deal with failures because um, I had somebody posit this interesting question of, wouldn't it be better if we solved the, all these failures in hardware? A student in the Georgia Tech class said, well, why don't we just design our hardware to not fail? Of course, that sounds really great in theory, but in practice, um, it reminded me of a workshop I went to in, in 2000 called the Scalable, Scalable Global Parallel File Systems Workshop. And one of the speakers talked about how, at the time, they had assembled a cluster of 128 Sun workstations, each of which had 40 disks attached. And the longest they had been able to get all of the hardware working at the same time was 18 minutes. 
there was so much hardware that even with very low failure rates, failures happened all the time. As you scale up, failure becomes no longer an uncommon event. I mean, Percentage-wise, it's still an uncommon event, but you're always dealing with failures. And I've heard this talk over and over and over again. I heard this talk at, at the uh, Fast, Work, uh, Fast Conference years ago when, at the time, it was the general manager of Amazon's S3, probably 15 years ago now. And she talked about how they literally had pallets and pallets and pallets of disk drives showing up every single day at their data centers because even if they had a mean time to failure of five years, once you had a million of these things, it meant you were losing multiple disk drives every single day. Probably five, ten years after I heard that talk, I heard people talk about how now we actually don't even replace individual disk drives. When you go into a data center, what we do is we actually build entire racks. The racks will have extra hardware in them, redundant hardware. They literally bring these, these pre-built racks in with a forklift, they push it back into place, they put it down on the ground, somebody comes in and puts all the cabling together, and most of the cabling's already been pre-wrapped, pre it's already done, so you're just plugging big cables in, not little cables, because there are top of rack switches. And as things fail, they just automatically replace them, until enough things have failed on that rack that they then just take it out of service. They don't replace the individual components on the data center floor. They replace the whole rack. And that rack might be sitting there dead for four months before they bring that forklift, forklift in, pull that rack out, and send it back someplace where it will actually be rebuilt and brought back. Um, I had a friend, I don't think he's working there anymore, although he might be. I think he moved to a health startup company, but he was working at a company called Unisys which has been around for a very long time. Um, they, they build these racks. They service these racks. This is what they do for a living. They actually custom build these things and put them into data centers. And when they break, they pull them back out and they send them out away and they, they fix them and they put replacement racks in. It's not actually possible for us to build truly failure-free systems. It just isn't. And I've made that point earlier but our real lesson here is how do we deal with those failures? Failure is really an inevitable part of what we have to handle. We can't handle the destruction of the Earth. Not yet. We've, that's what we've got the Lunar Data Project for. But I'm suspecting if somebody blows up the Earth, it will probably take out the Moon as well. So that's why we need the Martian data center. Maybe the Saturn data center will do it. I don't know. We won't have a heat problem there, at least, since it's really cold. Um, there are also fun things like the fact that once we get into large enough systems, we cross administrative domains. So we, uh, how many of you have internet service? Nobody has internet service. You guys have, you know, well, he's using UBC Wi-Fi, so it's pretty, pretty dodgy. Um, anybody use Shaw? Anybody use Telus? There we go. I, I see hands. You have both? Oh, okay. Telus. I thought your hand went up for both of them, but yeah, okay, so great. Well, Shaw and Telus are, is going to shock you, are different administrative domains. And yet they can talk to each other. So somewhere, somebody is reconciling these things. That's kind of the miracle of the internet, is that if we hadn't started off with a bunch of people who really wanted to cooperate, we probably wouldn't have this nice big general domain. Because that's the way it was when I was a kid. Literally, you know, you could dial up AOL or CompuServe or uh, you know, to local bulletin board services, and they were all disjoint. They didn't interact with each other. When I first started sending email to a friend at Microsoft, I had to send it through the University of Washington via the Unix to Unix copy protocol, UUCP. We ran bulletin board services on UUCP. UUNet was a big bulletin board service. It still exists in some form or other, but that was it. I mean, people would like send this stuff, and literally it was different Unix computers calling each other up and transferring data across the telephone line. 
insane, isn't it? And even as stupid as that sounds, it built this whole model of allowing cross-domain interactions. And that is what we, what we do today. We've just refined that. It's now highly automated. We take it for granted. We just get annoyed when it breaks, because it does break sometimes. Um, we have to support some surprisingly sophisticated operations as we build our ever more complex mobile networks. And you include things like supporting broadcast and multicast. I mean, at the time that, that uh, Steve Deering was doing the multicast work, I thought it was really cool, right? Because you send one message and it arrives at multiple locations. We have a model for that. That's what broadcast does. But multicast was kind of a, a, a limited sort of one-to-many relationship. And from a networking perspective, this made a lot of sense because it meant that I could send I could send the TV show out to the six people who are watching it, but I only had to send one copy. Now, of course, what happens now is that you turn on Netflix and you turn the same exact show on 30 seconds later, you're not getting the same packets, the, the same copy. You're getting your own unique copy. So as much as I thought IP multicast was kind of cool, we don't really use it as much as our as I wish we did, but we have to support it in the infrastructure anyway. Um, we send things out, so we, we break a problem up into, into a sharded space, and then we have you compute a little piece, and you compute a little piece, and you compute a little piece, and then we assemble it. Routine folding, SETI at home, these are examples of these kinds of uh, divide and conquer sorts of strategies, and we see those, and they have to work in this environment. We have to be able to do things that are uh, atomic. So one of the techniques we can use for that are to, to institute, introduce what we call barriers so that we have certain guarantees. If you're running a program on a computer and you make a change to a value in memory, the actual guarantee you get from the system as to whether or not other people on the same computer can see it will vary. We use barriers as a way of saying, I want to see the most recent copy of this, not yesterday's copy. And I've talked about eventual consistency versus uh, strict consistency. And most of the, the replication work we've done is strict consistency. I haven't spent as much time looking at eventual consistency. And yet, most of the actual implementations of the world are eventual consistency, where I think of Google Spanner, where you, get a, a, you have a window. The barrier there is a time barrier. It says we're going to wait until this far is, it has elapsed so we, we can now reason about what must have happened. In, um, in PMMC, we have that list of, of proposals that we don't know if they've been accepted or not yet. That's our uncertainty window. That's our, I don't know what happened here. Was it accepted? Was it not accepted? La -dee -da. And so we had to serialize our log with the people doing a get by making sure that the get was satisfied after our log was consistent. We used the same kind of trick that Spanner had to use, which was we say, okay, well, these are the things that I don't know the outcome of yet, so I don't want you to read the database until those have all been applied. I could optimize that away. I could simply look at this and say, well, let's see, these operations affected the, what I'm going to return to the get, so I'll wait until those operations are done. You can, you can make it more sophisticated. You can make it a more optimal performing kind of barrier. I mean, it, literally, if somebody does a get on a key that's currently not in any of the proposals, you don't need to block. You can just give them the value back. There's no reason to serialize them at that point but it requires extra code to do that. Uh, compare and swap is a fun one. It's very powerful. We use it a lot in, in systems where we say, grab a value, and if the value is what I think it should be, then replace it with this other value. That's a really nice way of implementing atomic operation. I think I just sold this book. I thought there was one. I'm making that count zero. 
But if that value is not one, then don't do this. And that's simple, but what happens if the value is two because somebody put one into stock? Well, you can say, well, okay, I'd like to optimize that case away. So I'll say, I, I, could, I could say, as long as it's at least one decremented. So now I have an operation as opposed to an absolute value. And I could do that instead. So that whether or not a particular optimization like that is worth the extra complexity is one of those decisions you will have to make that is specific to what you're trying to do. You're sitting there at your, your new job building distributed systems. You have to keep th constantly thinking about these things. It's not possible to optimize for everything. And it's almost not, in fact, it's almost counter useful. Terrible way of saying it. It's almost terrible in terms of using your own resources to optimize things that don't matter. Uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil, I believe is what Donald Knuth said. And he's absolutely right. My experience in optimizing systems, you sit down, you build your code, you spend a whole bunch of time up front trying to optimize what you think the bottleneck is, and then you actually measure the system, you find out that was never a bottleneck to begin with. It's this other thing. And there's always a bottleneck. Your intuition about those bottlenecks is, even after a lot of experience, tenuous at best. Timing, got to deal with how long it takes to do things. Latency is a killer. RDMA, that's a really cool model. We build it into our network interface cards now. You can literally have somebody over here talking to your memory directly. It doesn't have to go through your CPU. You don't even have to know that it's happening. The system has to deal with this all properly. And then we simulate this over a network. It's funky. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I haven't done any work with direct cache injection, but the idea there would be that we directly tell you what you should put in your cache, like your processor cache, for example. Here, put this into your cache, because we think you're going to need it. Um, I can see instances where that might be useful. If you're literally building key value stores, you could be pro proactively planting things into the caches at the edge nodes going, look, we know that at 8 a.m. in your local time zone, this is what's going to be hot. So we're going to start pushing this now. So it's there rather than blocking and waiting for you to start getting it when you need it. Why would you do that? Only so much bandwidth. If you can use bandwidth when it's not in demand to smooth out the bandwidth in it when it is in demand, it's a win. It's a performance win. This is complicated. There's lots of sophisticated things that we can do to optimize our performance here. Underneath this, we've got our hardware. We're optimizing it to deal with lots of different possibilities. We can have dedicated networks for, for different classes of traffic. Um, we can build logical configurations of our hardware on top of the actual physical hardware. Uh, VLANs are maybe a simple example of that, where the actual network, there, there aren't m multiple local area networks there. What we do is we, we take an extra byte out of every packet and we say, you're on VLAN, whatever the number is, between 0 and 255. So now it makes it look like we have 255 different lo local area networks on top of one actual local area network. I'm here. You get Edge of Rome, you get UBC Secure, you get UBC Visitor. All the same network. I know that might surprise you. They don't actually have three different wireless access points. They have one wireless access point that advertises three SSIDs. And when those packets come in, they put them on different VLANs. Underneath, it's all one network. So they have a logical separation as opposed to a physical separation. As we begin to build out our peer-to-peer -peer networks, especially with mobile devices, this is really where, where this all goes, we end up putting very high-end network facilities inside of our compute centers. We geo-replicate them so they are literally all over the world. Um, whether you're in Perth or you're in Sydney, I like the fact that there's a data center on that picture in Perth. There's like nothing else on the west coast of Australia. 
course, there's, all, there's nothing between Perth and Sydney either. <laughs> Anybody been to Australia before? People don't really live on the interior. I actually knew somebody. Um, and he lived in Melbourne, but his, his mom lived in like, like I don't know, 100 kilometers from Alice Springs, literally. The number of deadly creatures is num higher than the number of human creatures. Hmm. Non-human deadly creatures. <laughs> I have to be careful here. <laughs> um, so we have these very interesting systems. And we're going to be doing, most of what we've been talking about are the things that we do inside of these back-end systems in order to support these mobile devices. Almost everything that's going on inside of that data center infrastructure is going to be using the techniques that we are talking about. We're going to have racks. Those racks are going to have redundant hardware. They're going to have these switches at the top that can support, I mean, this picture is already kind of kind of old. 10 gigabits? I can buy 10 gigabit NIC cards now for my PC at home. Last I looked, the, the state of the art was 400 gigabits. And of course, they were going to push 800 gigabits, which has probably happened since then. You don't have an 800 gigabit NIC card for your home PC right now. Those are still like 10 or $20,000 each. So they're pretty crazy. They have very high speeds, very low or very high bandwidth. But you know what actually... Ultimately, rules here, latency. It can't go faster than the speed of light. That whole thing I was talking to, to you about earlier, about cut through, is to there, we're, we're deliberately trying to minimize our latency. The reason we start routing packets out the output port before we finished receiving them from the input port is that it lowers the latency. Most of our latency doesn't come from the transmission of light through a fiber. Most of it comes from the actual uh, store and forward. So it's our switches and our routers that are introducing that latency, not, not the fibers. I mean, we can run fiber, you can run a, a, a single mode fiber 100 kilometers and have minimal attenuation. We run fiber across the ocean. It, it, there are repeaters on it, but we run fiber across the ocean. There are basically boats. That's all they do all the time is they just start laying more fibers. When fibers break, we just replace them because it's not like you can pull it up and fix it. No more than you can pull up a, a sabotaged gas pipeline and fix it either. Same general problem. It's really hard to work at depth and do anything with it. But we know how to build fibers and put them down on the ocean floor. That's good. Latency would be the killer here. Even in the data center, latency is a big issue. As we begin to do it over terrestrial fiber lines, it becomes an issue. I like using the, the lunar and Martian data centers because it makes it really easy to understand the latency. This is just a matter of scale. We build our peer-to-peer -peer systems on top of this infrastructure, this network backbone where we have data centers and we have uh, lots of terrestrial networks. I mean, almost all the traffic these days goes terrestrially. It is expensive to send things up into the sky and bounce them back down. It's gotten a lot cheaper now since you can go get Starlink for uh, 90 to $130 a month. But they're doing that by putting lower Earth order breathing satellites up. And there's still like 50 millisecond latency doing that. I think that's great because um, I remember gaming over a regular satellite connection where it was 300 milliseconds up and 300 milliseconds back down. And um, gaming on 600 millisecond ping times isn't a lot of fun. We run lots of peer-to-peer -peer systems. There's a couple of examples of them here. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever used BitTorrent. Shame on you. I don't really care. Uh, Tor, Bitcoin, 
Ethereum, uh, those are all good examples of peer-to-peer -peer systems that people probably have heard of. Any of you actually know what Bitcoin is? Internet monopoly money. Well, the problem with that analysis is that you could argue that almost all money is in monopoly money at this point. Um, that is the more interesting lesson from SVB and all banks is that banks are actually just nothing more than ledgers. Your money in your bank account is nothing more than an electronic entry in a database at some financial institution. It becomes more real when you go to a bank machine and you have it spit out actual cash. But even that, what is it? It's a piece of polymer plastic. What defines money actually is utility. This is a problem for Bitcoin, but I'll save that for the uh, blockchain discussion. Um, Bitcoin is well known because of course it is a, a massive energy pig. We consume vast amounts of electricity to do lots of unnecessary work. And the Ethereum people have proven that it's unnecessary because of course they have come up with a protocol that um, does it the right way, which is we give the rich more voting than the poor, which is what we call proof of stake. So if you're a rich capitalist, you get to vote more than a poor um, communist. Or maybe if you're a rich communist, you get more vote than a poor capitalist. It's just rich or poor, right? Um, in Bitcoin, it's, it's basically who gets lucky. Any of you mine any coins? I mean, what else can you do with UBC's electricity? You can just randomly plug miners into places. People, people have done that in the past. I knew a guy who paid for his undergrad education by mining Bitcoin on computers in the computer facilities. Uh, San Jose State. That was when you could still mine it with CPUs, so it was a few years ago. More than a decade at this point. Okay, so in peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, one of the problems we have is how do you find the right peer to talk to? Well, we could have a single centralized registry, but then the problem, of course, is that we have um, somebody we have to trust. But it's efficient because it means we only have to send one request and get one response back. So all we're paying is one round trip time latency. Uh, the example that was used on the slides that I start, stole was Napster. Does anybody remember Napster? Napster was a music sharing service that got put out of business by getting sued into the, into the dust. They're actually still around, I think, but not in the same Thing that they were. And that's when BitTorrent based solutions took over because BitTorrent solutions are not centralized. So, um, an interesting downside to having centralized trusted authorities is that they can be attacked. And if the rights holders can get them taken down, then you can't borrow that music that you really wanted or watch that show that you really wanted. Well, the alternative then is for us to just simply like shout, hey, does anybody know where I can find? These are called gossip protocols. You should have studied those in networking. Broadcast and uh, selectively send messages. It doesn't make any difference, but you have a mechanism for talking to things in your neighborhood and asking questions and they then can direct you to where you might be able to get responses and eventually get a response. The problem here is that there's no bound on the lookup time then because you may talk to somebody and they don't have the answer, but they have, you know, it's, it's like, well, I don't know, but maybe you've talked to so-and-so. This is very human, isn't it? And you don't know how long it's gonna do it, uh, take to do that. But there's no single point of failure. There's no place that we can attack this particular system and bring it down. Uh, examples of this include Nutella, which I don't know. Does anybody use Nutella anymore? Okay. There. At least it's not completely dead. I'm looking at this. Yeah, well, it's, it actually is pronounced Nutella, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's just a peer-to-peer -peer network system. Uh, Bitcoin, at least people will know. I, I'm, I'm like, 
I, I really should go look up more modern examples of these things, but I don't think it matters. It's not super important. Here's an interesting technique, and this is really what I thought was the, the, the gem of this particular discussion, which is we can actually create hash tables. Remember our consistent hashing model? Well, okay, so this isn't exactly the same thing, but it is still the whole idea of hashing things. But instead of what we build is a distributed hash table, which you could implement with this with consistent hashing. These are routing tables that we actually provide in a distributed fashion. Gosh, we're back to distributed systems again. Yes, we can use Paxos to make these things consistent with each other. It's awesome. So we have a decentralized index with a probabilistic bound, not guaranteed, but probabilistic. So it's probably going to work, which is better than not going to work at all, or uh, we don't know how long it's ever going to take. Can't even reason about it, which me, to me feels like FLP in action, right? Well, yeah, we'll just put that message off for another message. We'll be fine. Uh, and examples of this include Cord. Cord is actually an a real running distributed hash table. Uh, Kadami, Kad, Kadimlia, I'd never heard of it before. I actually went and looked it up and made sure there was a live link that worked yesterday, day before yesterday when I put these together. And um, Amazon DynamoDB is another example of a distributed hash table. That's not Dynamo. Dynamo was the key value store. DynamoDB is a distributed hash table based uh, SQL database. So people really do implement these. They are actually used very heavily. What does the distributed hash table do? Well, let's see. We give it a hashing function, and then we use that to map something into a range of locations. And this is, like I said, very similar to that uh, idea of uh, uh, consistent hashing. When we sharded things, we used consistent hashing in order to be able to add and subtract and move things around. And in essence, that's what we're doing here again. But we're not actually maintaining uh, a database below it. We're just maintaining a hash table. This is just routing information. That's all it is. How do I get to the service that you're offering if I don't know about you? Well, I flood the network. I start asking questions. I find out where the nearest node of the distributed hash table is. And I can start looking at the distributed hash table. And it'll point me off to where I need to go. This is great. So I have an object, I hash it, and it goes into a fixed size space. So it gives me a distribution of things. And now I have a list of IP addresses to go ask about that object based upon what the hash value was. Now, of course, it's probably not going to be a three entry hash table, but we could start there. Now, we have seen this before. This is very similar to the whole idea behind uh, uh, consistent hashing. So you use some sort of a cryptographic secure hash function. SHA-256, SHA-512 are very popular. 256 is the most popular. It, it has good scatter. We haven't seen any collisions on it so far. Um, and all of the ones that are smaller, we have ways of breaking. SHA-1 has been broken. MD5 was broken like a decade ago. And when I say broken, what that means is that we know of two files that have the same hash value. And what that means is, and Google actually did it with MD5, done it with SHA-1, they actually found ways of cleverly corrupting the file in an automated fashion that would lead to the same hash value, even though it was different contents. So it's one thing to have collisions. It's another thing to actually have an algorithm for modifying or corrupting the file. Uh, there are some protections against that. If you actually insist the files be the same size, that significantly reduces your ability to hack them. The, the way that Google initially did this was they just added extra crap at the end until they got the right hash value. So they changed the size of the file. Um, you laugh, but I have been looking at doing cross-storage cross comparisons of files. And Google uses MD5 hashes. Dropbox uses SHA-256. 
Uh, OneDrive used to use SHA-1, but apparently is upgraded to SHA-256 as well. And the reason this is important is because, of course, if I have the hash values and I can compare them directly, I can tell you if they're likely to be duplicates. And the likelihood that two files have the same length and the same SHA-256 value is vanishingly small, that they're different. They are the same file. And being able to say with high probability that they are the same file saves you the need to fetch them and compute your own hash and compare the files, which can become expensive. And if you're doing this for one file, it's not a big deal. If you're doing it for millions of files, yeah, it starts to take some serious time. Uh, what was I was um, enumerating that spoke? I think it was Google Drive. I was doing this last night. I was literally enumerating the files on Google Drive, and after 30 seconds, the API would break. Maybe it wasn't Google Drive. It was one of them. It would only go for 30 seconds, and then it would time out. I have more than 30 seconds worth of files just to pull the metadata on. How frustrating. OK, so we create a ring. We have n nodes, but not all of those nodes actually have any data stored in them. So we, haven't, we, we don't need to have as many machines storing pieces of our distributed hash table as we have nodes on the hash table. When we go to insert, we compute which node we think should have this. And if the node exists, then we actually add our new value to that node. If the node doesn't exist, then we go to the next node and we put our value there. Gosh, this is kind of like project five, isn't it, in some ways? Was insert the lookup. So now when we do lookup, it's pretty easy. We compute the hash value of our key and we go and we look at the node. And if that node exists, then it should have our key if it's there. And if it's not there, we know that this key is not present in the database. I didn't have to look at the entire table to figure this out. I only had to go look at one node. If I find there's not a node there, then I go to the next node because I know the entry has to be in the next node of the table. Now, the nice thing about this is it makes it easy for us to insert. We can add. So, so if one of these nodes gets too big, we can split it. And we can move that data. This always requires order n searches. Because, you know, it might not, the next node might not be there either. So we have to keep doing it, keep iterating over it. Um, so we could potentially have to walk the entire ring to find out there's only one node. Um, can we do better than that? And the Cord folks said, yes, we actually can. And they created these things called finger tables. And finger tables are a mechanism by which we can actually tell you at a given entry where the next node that's alive is. I'm not going to go into any great detail here. It's just interesting to note that this is an optimization. It's well understood. The cord code is open source. You can go look at it. There are articles about it. Their technique is, is kind of cool. I think intuitively it makes a certain amount of sense. So and the benefit is it gives us an order log n lookup, which is way faster. So. And especially when we have network latencies in here. The thing that kills us here in terms of actual cost is that we have to send messages and figure out what is and isn't present. And if we have to do that on a bunch of nodes that just aren't present, then it takes a while. Here, we've eliminated an awful lot of those messages because I just simply have to find a node and then it will tell me where the next node is. This supports the ability to add and remove nodes. We can move our data around. This is Project 5, isn't it? We can update our little finger tables. I don't think we require you to do finger tables in Project 5. So um, you can look at this as an optimization beyond what, what Project 5 demands. Anybody worked on Project 5 yet? You looked at it and said, oh, maybe next week. I can do it on Wednesday night before it's due. 
Just note, that's not a Monday dude. It's a Thursday dude. Hey, I didn't set the schedule. Last day of classes is Thursday. So the people who have class on Friday normally, they get a free pass. We had that conversation at the beginning of class. Okay, so it improves or uh, we can improve the performance of this if we actually store additional state. I'm not going to go into those optimizations. I don't think they're, I, I think it's important to know that this exists, but until you actually need to implement a uh, distributed hash table, like, I don't know, a sharded key value store, you don't care about those optimizations and you won't need them for project five. But some of you still, even though you don't need things, insist on doing them and so that's fine, it's here. I've now given you one more pointer to something. And it gives us prob probabilistic guarantees. I like that. Most likely, it will work this way. And that's actually good enough for the real world. Another way of, of organizing naming information is using hierarchical, uh, hierarchical spaces. Uh, this is balancing the cost of communications versus the cost of overlay maintenance. So the downside to hierarchy is that it increases the number of things I have to communicate with. The deeper the hierarchy is, the more things I have to go and talk to. And then you end up flattening your hierarchy because you don't really want to talk to 36 different servers before you get to where you actually want to go. It's like, I, I, I've been working in file systems a long time. File systems are, are key value stores with a hierarchical namespace on top of them. And those hierarchical namespaces and file systems can get really deep. I mean, you got a few million files. You're just going to put them, like, tried unpacking the data set. We're doing some, some work with uh, looking at search engines, file search engines. Found very interesting things. They don't behave the same. Not surprised at this, but they don't behave the same. And I couldn't actually unpack the data set because it was too deep. That the, uh, the Win32 interface has a limit of 260 characters. The underlying operating system supports 32,767 characters but that can't be accessed through the normal Win32 interface. And Unix, on the other hand, doesn't have that same limit. It still runs into that limit. It has a 1,024 limit. So these can get really deep. We have to balance that out. We tend to try and keep our hierarchical namespaces fairly shallow here as a result of that. Think of DNS as being a good example of a hierarchical namespace that we try to maintain fairly shallow depth on. We have top level domain servers that own all of the, the suffixes and then we assign the next part of the name to an entity. And then that entity controls the, the next parts of the name. You don't see very many four and five level deep domain names. And the way that DNS is set up, it's a hierarchy of, of three levels. And that helps balance our performance, the, the cost of communication. So these are really useful when we have different properties for nodes. Uh, we may choose different solutions depending upon how we're communicating with them. We often end up with hybrid approaches to this where we have both gossip-based non-hierarchical discovery mechanisms and then hierarchical namespaces. So you, for example, might discover the, the name server by just simply broadcasting messages out. Uh, when I first got Done with my degree, and I was working for Chariton down at Stanford. One of the things we had was, in fact, um, a whole local naming system that was, I only found out years later, part of a DARPA funded project on satellite based, uh, a tank controlled satellite, a tank driven satellite based satellite controlled warfare. And one of the things they used was local naming, where you broadcast out and talk to your neighbors to figure out what they're doing. You see that in autonomous cars. They still do that, right? Because the cars you care most about are the ones that are within your broadcast range. Because they're right there. And that proximity makes a difference. And you can actually find out things from them. So if the car in front of you starts braking, it can tell you, hey, I'm braking. You don't have to wait to see the lights. You can actually see the signal from the other car that says, I have now applied the brakes. I'm now going slower. So you don't slam into the back of them. That's the downside to cameras. In mobile networks, 
We have mobile support stations and mobile hosts, and we end up building these kinds of hybrid networks and hybrid organizational structures because we have to attend to the relative performance and behavior. We have different technologies in this space. Mobile support stations are stationary. They have high-speed wired networks. They don't actually care about power. Eh, we don't need to sink in power because they plug into the grid. Mobile devices, on the other hand, are pretty much of the opposite extreme, which is, uh, so, so they're mobile, which means they can change. They are associated with a given mobile support station, but they can switch. They have lower speed networks, typically. These network speeds keep getting faster, but then our backbone wired networks also continue to get faster. And they have battery power concerns. Your 100 milliwatt milli phone tries to use the smallest signal it can because that uses the least amount of your battery, so it means that your phone will last for more than the four hours that, that it typically does. It's gotten a lot better that way. Anybody carry a mobile battery pack with them? Like an extra phone. <laughs> so you can plug your phone in so it doesn't die. It's gotten a lot better. You don't really have to do that anymore. If you forget to plug your phone in for a couple of days, then maybe it'll go dead. But we continue to try and optimize that. So these are very different constraints. Um, in our mobile network, we want to be able to find a given mobile host really fast. Hey, we got an incoming call for them. We got to actually route it correctly. Uh, we need to have a very highly responsive overlay state. We have to minimize our communications overhead, and we have to make sure that we're not asking our phones to constantly update us on where they are. I mean, they still do it fairly regularly, but. A lot of interesting balancing that goes on here. And then, of course, notice that there's a lot of heterogeneity here. And so these, these devices have very different constraints, which makes designing distributed systems here challenging for us. So we have different algorithms. We have to consider what does it cost for us to look for something? What does it cost for us to add or remove something? And what is the cost of the changing nature of our network? As our devices move, our network structure changes. The cell towers are negotiating handoffs and whatnot, and we don't even see that. It's, it's pretty much seamless. But our phones have to know what cell towers it can talk to, and the cell towers are going to tell it when to switch to another cell tower. And then you get in the elevator, and it's all bets are off, because you put your phone in a Faraday cage, hmm, signals don't work. So we have to consider what is the cost of wireless, what is the uh, network behavior of wireless versus wired. And generally, we care a lot about wireless costs and mobile ho host network performance, way more than we care about the performance of the, uh, the, the wired systems. Our communications costs are generally modeled as being two times the cost of our wireless plus whatever the cost of searching is. Um, and we have, so we've got a couple of algorithms here. Algorithm one is a logical, logical ring of mobile hosts. And then uh, the cost there is that finding them means that we have to do something that's the maximum of the network cost of mobile host or the wireless access cost of the mobile host. And the second algorithm is a, is a two-tiered hierarchical scheme. Gee. Like I said, small hierarchies, but they, they turn out to be a big win because they, uh, they cut our overhead dramatically. And in this particular case, this is a huge win because now it is much more an issue of how much the cost is in our mobile support systems. And our mobile support station, mobile support stations, we don't care about those costs nearly as much as we care about our mobile host costs. So having a hierarchical structure, two-level hierarchical structure for our naming suddenly becomes a big win. But this isn't true in all cases. So we we may actually um, we may actually find that uh, let's see. So we originally start. We only look for our mobile support station when we actually uh, need it. And that way, we don't have to actually update anything until we move and try to use it. So you know, if, you're not, if your phone's in your pocket and you're not using it, there's actually no reason to update. 
uh, update things there. So what we're probably going to actually do is reduce the frequency with which we make sure that we're, we're singing, syncing up with our mobile port service. That makes sense. So you trade these things back off. Um, the second algorithm is a much more aggressive update. So when you switch from one mobile support system to another, uh, in that algorithm, we update the old one. We say, you don't have to worry about this mobile host. I got it now. And that one turns out to be more expensive. So you have these kinds of trade-offs. The, the group that I work with at Georgia Tech does a lot of, of mobile work. They actually had people who were working on um, 5G before 5G became a standard. And now, of course, they're off working on 6G. 6G is where it's at. And they do a lot of edge work. If you hear the term edge, much of what we're talking about is this kind of mobility. When we, uh, last week when we had um, Royals talk, he was talking about metaverse, and a lot of that was from the perspective of people who are using mobile devices to build their, their virtual reality worlds. There's metaverse, so you can you know, hold your phone up and you, you can play games on it. Or, of course, the, the dream is to actually be able to have headsets. One of the challenges in those headsets is that if you don't actually have everything synchronized correctly, it makes people sick. It turns out we are very sensitive to mismatches in visual clues, and they will create motion sickness. So all of the stuff about you know, mobility and the importance of mobility and keeping the latency down and whatnot become really, really important if you don't want people to chuck when they're playing your VR game. That's an interesting way of thinking of distributed systems. I just need to make my customers not get sick. So that's, like I said, most of the rest of the lectures, I've got one more beefier lecture, but most of the rest of the lectures are, are all discussions of how do we actually use these distributed systems. So they're trying to give you some idea of why you've just spent the last you know, 10 weeks of your life wasting it away in this hellhole of a class. And, and that is because we actually use this to build real things because we actually have to solve hard problems. And our solution to everything is going to be this Greek island. So, anybody have any questions? Awesome. Awesome. Well, I like that. Hopefully the crowd at um, home enjoyed the talk too. I will turn off the stream now and I'll stop recording because I think... <laughs>